This morning we continue our sermon series on Psalms as we look at Psalms of Lament. Lament is defined as a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. So these prayers are expressions of loss, but also of faith and hope in God, written by real people living real lives as they try to make sense of the sorrows they experience. Most interpreters today treat Psalm 42 and 43 as one psalm because a number of Hebrew manuscripts present the psalms together and in one text and because the psalms share a vocabulary and theme. So this morning we will be looking at Psalms 42 through 43 as one text. This prayer has three parts, moving from complaint to petition and ending in hope. The speaker is in crisis and engages in an inner self dialogue in the refrain as a way of expressing the significance of the crisis and moving forward. The emphasis of the psalm seems to be exile from the temple, the place where the psalmist has experienced God's presence. We are reminded of the ancient Israelite community's experience of exile and longing for return to Zion and to the temple, the defining place of worship. So the author may be a leader of the community, voicing the prayer of this psalm in the crisis of exile. The opening stanza begins with the striking image of the deer thirsting for water where there is none. We are led to imagine a magnific magnificent stag migrating through the tablelands of Palestine. One watering hole after another has run dry. We see the deer with parched tongue standing between the rocks panting for water. The stag's deep and long braying of desolation expresses his utter anguish at not finding the life-giving water that every cell in his body is craving. And just as water is necessary for his life, so also is the divine presence. The speaker remembers powerful worship services of communion with God and yearns again for that life-giving reality. Tears rather than nourishing divine presence mark life in the current crisis. And to put insult to injury, the psalmist is in the midst of taunting, insulting voices of enemies, those who feel they have power over him. They humiliate him by pointing to his God-forsaken condition, saying, Where is your God? Then the psalmist lifts the curtain from his past experience. And we see who he was and what he was. He was a musician, a player of the harp, and a leader of pilgrims to the holy place. Happy were the days when he led the multitude in holiday mood and festive attire into the temple. How poignant now are such memories, how they stir him to the depths of his being. Yet how different is the present mood of his spirit in the, re <clears throat> excuse me. in the refrain that is repeated again and again, we hear his agony. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? His whole being is depressed and despondent. The psalmist is far from the temple. And he is in the constant presence of enemies who taunt him, whose heartless words crush him and crush his spirit. He stands in grave peril of his life, so much that in his vivid imagination, he seems to hear the floodwaters of the underworld, the realm of the dead, sweeping up upon him, drowning him in their power. In his distress, his great inner longing leads him to remember God. In the fear that death is imminent, the psalmist day after day and night by night prays to the Lord for help and waits expectantly for it to come. Although God seems to have 
have given him over to the power of his enemies to face all day and day after day their crushing taunts. His spirit is still profoundly depressed, but the deep darkness of his soul's abandonment has been penetrated by a growing spiritual confidence. And we hear him cry out, I shall again praise him, my help and my God. He is still miles from the temple. The treachery and injustice of persistent oppression make him feel spurned by God. If only he can be brought to the place where God dwells, his longing to be in the presence of God rises to its deepest intensity. He imagines that God will send out two angels like messengers, light and truth, who come to him in his crisis and gently lead him to the temple. And now he is certain that his prayers will be heard and that he will be vindicated by God. So as in characteristic, so as in characteristic of the lament, his prayer ends not in the mood of depression, but in the bubbling up of a feeling of thanks. It is the expression of the certainty of his faith, sublime confidence that waiting for God will not be in vain. The psalmist portrays a person at prayer in the midst of simultaneous despair and hope, not unlike the experience of Jesus as he prayed to our his father in the New Testament reading, when he said to his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he prays, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then those piercing words heard during the crucifixion when he cried out the words of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, perhaps some of you remember back in 2007 when the pr private writings of Mother Teresa were made public. The world anticipated that she would leave behind inspiring accounts of God's intimate visitations but instead, we read the anguish, anguish cries about darkness and the absence of God. The saint of Calcutta complained of this terrible sense of loss, this untold darkness, this loneliness, this continual longing for God, which gives me that pain deep down in my heart. She confessed, the place of God in my soul is blank. And she protested, there is no God in me. I just hear my own heart and nothing comes. One would think that someone who has dedicated her life to Christ and to the care of others would have experienced more of a sense of God's presence. But to be quite honest with you, I find Mother Teresa's confession, like the cries of God's absence in the Psalms, and from Jesus and many other saintly folk, reassuring for someone who has experienced times of desolation, abandonment, and loneliness, and knows experientially the uncertainties of faith. Few persons get through life without moments or even extended periods of living life from the dark side, feeling abandoned and forsaken and insecure. Eagle and Henson suggest that when you feel the tug of God deep down in the center of your being, pledge your life to God and recognize yourself growing into an ever more intimate relationship, like or even closer than friendship you cultivate with another human being. You can feel entitled to expect God to be there for you. Then comes the reality in life protracted illness, death of a loved one, job loss, financial collapse, diminishment of vital faculties, natural disaster, and a myriad of other misfortunes. And you find yourself wailing in agony. Yet you not only do not get the answer you want, 
to an earnest plea, but you also get no answer at all. God seems to have gone AWOL. You feel like Teresa of Avila as she says, Lord, if this is the way you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. This is the lament of the poet. And if we're honest, it's our lament as well in some of the seasons of our lives. Walter Brueggemann, a preacher, theologian, and seminary professor, observes, it's no wonder that the church has intuitively avoided these psalms. They lead us into dangerous acknowledgement of how life really is. They lead us into the presence of God where everything is not polite and civil. They cause us to think unthinkable thoughts and utter unutterable words. Perhaps worse, they lead us away from the comfortable religious claims of modern modernity in which everything is managed and controlled. In our modern experience, but probably also in every successful and affluent culture, it is believed that enough power and knowledge can tame the terror and eliminate the darkness. But our honest experience, both personal and public, attests to the resilience of the darkness in spite of us. The remarkable thing about Israel is that they did not banish or deny the darkness from its religious enterprise. It embraces the darkness as the very stuff of new life. The very stuff of new life. That brings to mind the very first words written in the Hebrew and Christian Bible saying, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Should we not therefore live in hope that our dark night of the soul will give birth to new life? And yet our temptation is to vo avoid as if that were possible or to hurry through times of lament. Reverend Dr. Stephen Breck Reed, one of my seminary professors, wrote, when you study the laments in the comfort of your home and church, take time with your own heartache and the heartaches of those in the family and neighborhood. Laments have certain characteristics one of which is tenacity. When Christmas has been over for weeks, we know how tenacious tinsel is. It's still on the floor and the doormat where we took the naked tree after the season was over. But the tinsel reminds one not of the joy that is Christmas, but rather the sadness of the season. Many people did not get the Christmas spirit, a dark, gloomy depression that is as tenacious as tinsel without the tree and shrouds many people during the holiday season. And in the same way, the blues, the laments, enshroud and cling to us, refusing to let go. He goes on to say of the famous blues singer, when Billie Holiday sings, Good morning, heartache, or when the tattered tinsel is around, we should take time with our heartache. The laments charge us to do that. Often we rush too quickly to the good news and happy times. Whether we should follow Billie Holiday's point, a point echoed by the laments. Good morning, heartache. Sit down. Psalms of lament. They slow us down and invite us to stay for a while. Yet when we recognize our state of interior confusion and anxiety, often triggered by the disorientation of suffering and loss, we consider this a threat to our well-being, something to be avoided or hurried through. But they also represent, as the Spanish mystic John of the Cross observed, the occasion for a deepening of insight 
if not also clarifying a difficult truth we find ourselves facing. The path of such encounters, which he calls a dark night of the soul, confronts us with the trials of angry, anguish, even terror, familiar to the psalmist's cry. As he says, when, when shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? It is this when that is the difficult truth of the long night watch that carries us through the darkness. Thinking of the dark night brings to mind another question. Given the fact that God is beyond our knowing, should we not sometimes measure our faith by our sense of the absence of God as well as our sense of the presence of God? Knowing the unknowable leads us, as Thomas Kelly has said, beyond all earthborn securities and assurance, and leaves our old proud self utterly defenseless. Loving the unknown, unknowable makes us willing to risk everything with no assurance of success. It's the yearning that matters. With the psalmist, we simply cry out, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Many of us today experience seasons of crisis, and our culture suggests that we depend on ourselves for help rather than upon God. The result is isolation, fear, and hopelessness. The poet's journey, however, leads us towards hope, a hope that rests in the divine initiative. The poet yearns to be surrounded by the believing and worshiping community to participate in the worship service of the temple and to celebrate with the people the presence of God in their midst. This is not private piety or spiritual individualism. In his experience, God's help in the context of the worshiping community brings new life. This earthy prayer suggests that both despair and hope come in life and that both can lead one forward. Like Mother Teresa or Job, Jesus, and other saints that you may have known, you have to have experienced the presence of God, God Shekinah, in order to miss it. You won't miss someone with whom you've never experienced closeness, a closeness so deep that you could scarcely stand separation. This psalm moves beyond a private mourning to hope found in the worshiping community that God has created. The psalm is an important word of good news in our culture of anxiety, isolation, and despair. Life is dependent upon God just as life is dependent upon water. Augustine said of God, The thought of you, O God, stirs us so deeply that we cannot be content unless we praise you because you make us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. The Psalms are powerful prayers that passionately and emotionally express the realities of our lives and our relationships with God and one another. So sit down, slow down. Spend some time with these prayers. In doing so, may you experience peace and new life as you read, study, and pray these words. Amen. <laughs>